Hello, and welcome to chapter 9. Isn't that fine? Hopefully you're not in a bind. As you keep rhyming with the timing. And we'll bring you the greatest of estimation and confidence intervals. A lot of math's about to happen, but it's okay. We got this. So let's go ahead and do what we do and hit the learning objectives. There we go. So, starting off first, we're going to compute and interpret a point estimate of a population mean. Then we're going to compute and interpret a confidence interval for a population mean. And we're going to compute and interpret a confidence interval for a population proportion. Yes, a lot of pop, 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 pop. We're going to calculate the required sample size to estimate a population proportion or a population mean. I know, all oh, sounds fun. And you're me just like, so here we go. Pop, pop, pop. All right. So, point estimate. What the, what is this? Well, it is a single value used to estimate a population value. Yeah. This is a statistic computed from sample information that estimates a population parameter. Fun stuff. So they give us an example here called the Bureau of Tourism for Barbados. Wants an estimate of the mean amount spent by tourists visiting the country. They randomly select 500 tourists. As they depart and ask these tourists about their spending while they're the mean amount spent by the sample of 500 tourists serves as an estimate or the unknown population parameter. Yeah, so basically all we're looking at is the estimate here. Seems, <laughs> seems very, very fun here. I really mean, that's really what's going on is that we have an unknown factor that we're going to be trying to work with. Then, it's like, immediately jump into confidence intervals. <laughs> hey, went from learning objective one to learning objective two in just one slide. Typically happens, doesn't it? But, a confidence interval is a range of values within which the population parameter is expected to occur. Basically, this is what we've already been handling a lot with our standard deviations and everything. We were basically trying to do the probability of something happening. This is our confidence. This is how confident that we believe this will happen. Now, again, the standard definition in your book is a range of values constructed from a sample data so that the population parameters is likely to occur within that range, as specified <laughs> probability. The specified probability is called the level of confidence. So basically, how confident are we? Now, there are two situations for computing a confidence interval for a population mean. One, when the population standard deviation is known, which we hope. And another, when the population standard deviation is unknown. So we may end up have a little bit that we have to calculate. So, when we use the sample data to estimate uh, mu, basically our mean, uh, with... X and the population standard deviation is known. We use sample data to estimate mu with the mean, and the population standard deviation is unknown. In this case, we substitute the sam sample standard deviation for the population standard deviation. I like how they explain so well. We're going to get into that. Okay, <laughs> don't worry. So, Basically, the thing is, is that we're going to know, take what we know and replace the unknown. 
You're like going, no, no, that, that makes no sense. Believe me, we'll get into that. So the factors that determine the width of our confidence interval for a mean are, again, the number of observations in the sample, the variability in the population used to estimate by the sta sam sample standard deviation, and the desired level of confidence. How confident do we want to be? This is where you see like within 75%, 80%, 90%. As close to 100 as we can, we probably want to get there. Maybe. So let's start doing these formulas that somehow the PowerPoint was trying to explain already that didn't really explain. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's okay. We're good. We got this. All right. So level of confidence when standard deviation is known. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, to determine the confidence limits when the population standard deviation is known, we use the Z distribution. Yay, Z distribution. Doom, 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 doom. So the formula as it goes is, of course, our X bar, which is our sample mean plus R minus, basically plus and minus, Z, the Z value of a particular confidence level, multiplied by the standard deviation of the population, divided by the square root of the number of observations in the sample. Wow. So first thing is that we're going to have to remember how to get to Z value. Huh. No? That's the, the thing that ends up happening. So let's go ahead and keep going. All right. So the method for finding Z for a 95% confidence interval is as follows. Again, we want 95% confidence. So we're going to divide the confidence interval in half. 0.95 divided by 2, which equals to 0 0.4750. Then we're going to find that value in the body of the table. So they're, they're actually showing you um, right here in the table that it's going to be 1.96. Okay. Again, we're going to find it as closely as possible. So, again, identify the row and column, then add the values. The probability of finding a value between 0 and 1.96 is 0 0.4750. Hmm. I wonder where I've heard, seen that before. Maybe that empirical rule. Hmm. But, so, the population, the probability of finding a value between plus and minus 1.96 is 0.95. Zero, zero, 000 or 95 percent again they show us our symmetrical bell curve which the z value is based on of how to half it up okay there we go there's z value the z value why is any time that i hear z i want to think of the 90s there's too many things that ended with z then oh wow <laughs> I'm just playing with y'all. All right. So, another example. The American Management Association is studying the income of store managers in the retail industry. A random sample of 49 managers revealed a sample mean of 45,420. The standard deviation of the population is 2,050. What is the population mean? What is the estimate of the population mean? Well, I'm going to go jump back and forth because it does both the answer and the question in the same slide. The answer is, of course, we don't know this. We do not know the population mean, so we can use the sample mean. Okay? Which is 45,420 as our best estimate. The sample mean is the best point estimate 
of the unknown population. Again, there's our point estimate with everything that we know. So, two, what is a reasonable range of values for the population mean? Okay, so the AMA decides to use a 95% level of confidence. So we're going to use the equation in 9-1, that's what they say. Basically it's this, again, taking our sample mean, plus and minus the Z value, multiplied by the standard deviation of the square root of n. So that would be taking 45,420, plus and minus 1.96, since we already figured out 95% in the last slide, multiply it by 2 point, this should be a comma, <laughs> that's how I read it, uh, 2050, divide by the square root of 49, that's actually, should be 7, so, that's a nice one when they give you a, a square root that you can do in your head. But it comes out to 45,420 plus minus 574. So our confidence interval is for 95% level of confidence. It shows that the range is going to be 44,846 and 45,94. Now, that value of 574 is what we call a margin of error. If you ever hear margin of error, it's just that percentage of um, that could still be a little bit off. We do expect about 95% of these intervals to contain within the population mean. Okay, So about 5% of the intervals will not contain the population mean. This is due to a sampling error. And is the risk we assume when we select the level of confidence. Okay. So there can always be a margin of error. Now let's bring in something more fun. Most of the time, we are going to know um, the standard deviation. We probably will use this. But there is the occasionally, we have the unknown. So the formula changes just slightly. Okay. So we're going to be end up using a t distribution. So again, we have our sample mean, uh, x bar, plus minus, instead of z, now t, um, the t distribution. And we're going to have our sample deviation. So our sample standard deviation divided by, again, the square root of n. But we just added another distribution. Mm -hmm. Now you got to know the difference, and it's okay. That's why we're here. We have just figured out the unknown, we have t distributions. Known is z distribution. Okay. So, for our example, the dean of business college wants to estimate the mean number of hours full time students work at paying jobs each week. He randomly selects a sample of 30 students and ask them how many hours they worked last week. He can calculate the sample mean, but it's unlikely he would know the population standard deviation required for Formula 9-1. Right. So, here, we won't know the population standard deviation. It's unknown, so we have to move on to our sample. And that's about it with the example that they give. <laughs> Hopefully it comes back to it. We'll see. Let's go ahead and look at 
Why are they determined to use Z or T? Yeah, it doesn't really give us any more of that example. It's just one that shows that he can calculate the sample mean, but is unlikely to know the population standard deviation. It's really all that example is. They could have done better. So, when to use Z or T? Assume the population is normal. No matter what, we're going to assume that. Is the population standard deviation known? If it is, use Z. If it's not, use T. Okay. Works there. Characteristics of the T distribution. All right. So the T distribution is a continuous distribution. As we know, it's one of those that goes on for quite a while. It is a bell shape and symmetrical, just like the Z distribution. But it is flatter or more spread out than the standard normal distribution. As we can see with our little graph, it's just a tad bit flatter. It's closer to the x-axis. There is a family of t-distributions depending on the number of degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom are based on the sample size, n. And again, we're going to have a chart. And it's just like z-values. So, first we're going to assume the population is normal. And we're going to find the value of t. In your book, this is going to be appendix B.5, which moves across the columns identified for confidence intervals. Okay. So in the next example that it looks like we're going to have, we want to use the 95% level of confidence. So move on to that column. Then find the degrees of freedom. So since we're using sample statistics, now remember, sample size takes the number of how many we have minus one. So the degrees of freedom, again, is finding by that. So 10 minus one will equal nine. This is why we have 9 in the chart. And again, we're looking at that 95% column. So, degrees of freedom is taking the sample size, minus 1. And we find out that it's 2.262. Alright, so how does this look like in the example? Because apparently they put the chart before the example. Here we go. We have a tire manufacturer wishes to investigate the tread life of its tires. <coughs> Sorry. A sample of 10 tires driven 50,000 miles revealed a sample mean of 0.32 inch of tread remaining with a standard deviation of 0 0.09 inches. Our uh, inch. Uh, construction... Uh, construct a 95% confidence interval for the population mean. Would it be reasonable for the manufacturer to conclude that after 50,000 miles, the population mean amount of tread remaining is 0 0.30 inch? All right. So first off, again, how they find the t-value? Since we took a sample of 10 tires... There's our sample size. So degrees of freedom, 10 minus 1 will get us to that 9. Okay, Be careful. Do not use the actual number since it's a sample size for our degrees of freedom. It's always minus 1. All right. So using our formula, our sample mean plus minus our T distribution value, our T value, which according to the chart again is 2.262. Taking our sample deviation, 
or standard deviation of 0 0.909 inch divided by the square root of basically our sample size of 10. Okay, here, yes, here, we plug in the numbers. So 0 0.32 plus minus 2.262 multiplied by 0 0.09 divided by the square root of 10 will equal to 0 0.32 plus minus 0 0.064. Damn, there's a lot of decimals going on here. All right. So this really tells us our confidence interval are 0 0.256 and 0 0.384, with the margin of error being that 0 0.064. So the manufacturer can be reasonably sure that 95% confident that the mean remaining tread depth is between these two numbers. Because the value of 0 0.30 is in this interval, it is very likely that the mean of the population will be 0 0.30. Again, as long as it falls within that range, we are more confident to say that yes, it falls in, there's a highly likely chance that the mean is 0 0.30. Woo! You still going? You ready? Okay. Confidence intervals for proportions. So a proportion is the fraction ratio or percentage indicated the part of the sample of population having a particular trait or interest. Okay. So in earlier examples that we had, in this chapter, we use ratio scale of measurement. In this section, we use the nominal scale of measurement since the outcomes will be limited to two values. So, again, our formula for this sample proportion is going to be uh, P, the proportion, equals to X divided by N. So, for examples that they have, Southern Tech Career Services reports that 80% of its graduates enter the job market in a position related to their field of study. Okay. So, basically, we're just looking that they really I mean that proportion of 80%. Is that true? And, of course, they give another example. A recent study of married men between the ages of 35 and 50 found that 63% felt that both partners should earn a living. I like how they put that in. But, again, it's giving these did, these didn't. Kind of like a yes and no kind of to the question. So, again... We go and find our P, which is the proportion, by the number of successes divided by the number of observations. That's basically all we're doing. And then we define confidence intervals for proportions. So we start out with the sample proportion, and now it's time for the confidence interval formula. <laughs> So population proportion is identified by pi. Now again, this refers to the percentage of successes in the population, not the actual pi number. Okay, just a symbol this time. Uh, two requirements that have to be done. The binomial conditions have to be met. Okay, that means that the sample data are the number of successes in N trials. There are only two possible outcomes. 
We use label one of the outcomes as success and the other as failure. The probability of success remains the same from one trial to the next. The trials are independent. That means the outcome on one trial does not affect the outcome on another. It's when they all been met. So the values of n pi and n multiply 1 minus pi should both be greater than or equal to 5. This allows us to invoke the central limit theorem and employ the standard normal distribution, that is z, to complete the confidence interval. Lots of stuff. <laughs> so we construct a confidence interval for a population proportion with the following formula. After all those conditions are met. Okay. So proportion will be plus or minus the z value multiplied by the square root of the proportion multiply 1 minus the proportion, or p, <laughs> divided by n. Looks more complicated, but trust me, it will get a little bit easier. Okay. All right. Went the wrong way. There we go. So here's our example. The unit representation of the bottle blowers of America is considering a proposal to merge with the Teamsters Union. Okay. According to the BBA union bylaws, at least three-fourths of the union membership must approve any merger. A random sample of 2,000 current BBA members revealed that 1,600 plan to vote for the merger proposal. What is the estimate of the population proportion? Okay. Develop a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion based on your decision on the sample information. Can you conclude that the necessary proportion of BBA members favor the merger? Why? <laughs> Sounds like a lot, but here we go. First off, we do need to calculate the sample proportion, which is taking the number of successes divided by our sample number. So 1,600 that have voted yes to the plan divided by 2,000 that we have already surveyed. Okay, This equals 0.8. So about 80% have already kind of went, yeah, we'll go with this. This sounds good. Whoa. Merge with the Teamsters. So next, we're going to use the formula from <laughs> the last slide to determine the 95% confidence interval. Since we already figured out 95% confidence interval for Z is 1.96, we're good at finding the Z value already. Now, we're going to take the population, or proportion, sorry, proportion, P, 0 0.80, plus minus the Z value of 1.96, multiplied by the square root of 0 0.80, times 1 minus 0 0.80, divided by 2,000. Alright, so, this gives us this error margin, still of 0 0.018, Plus or minus will give us a confidence interval of 0.782 and 0.818. So we conclude that the merger will likely pass because both values are greater than the 75% of the union membership. That's how we can interpret these numbers. So if the poll was conducted 100 times with 100 different samples, we expect the confidence interval constructed from a 95 of this from 95% of the samples to contain the true population proportion. This is the procedure used by polling organizations, television networks, and surveys of public opinions on election night. Everyone well, they can already go. Yeah. 
the state's going to go this way or the state's going to go that way. This is what they're using. Like, yay! We just got confidence intervals. I bet y'all feeling so happy now. Alright. Determining sample sizes for means. I think we're all, all getting close to the end here. So, hopefully y'all got confidence intervals. I hope you're confident in confidence intervals. There we go. Get that confidence going. Just because I want to say confidence some more. Alright. So there are three factors that determine the sample size when we wish to estimate the mean. Again, we have the margin of error. E. The researcher will tolerate. Okay. The desired level of confidence, for example, 95%. Okay. Again, we notice the book is staying around, around 95%. It's okay. The variation of dispersion of the population being studied. Okay. The formula to determine the sample size of the mean is, again, the sample size. So we have N equals to the Z value of the standard deviation of the population. And your variation divided by the margin of error squared. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It does. It really does. And this is actually getting pretty interesting now. So, we do choose relatively high levels of confidence, such as 95% and 99%. Again, the book typically stays with 95%, and we use a Z statistic. Often, the population standard deviation is not known, so you may decide to conduct a pilot study, use a comparable study, or use a range-based approach to find this value. Okay, Lots of different ways that we can basically figure out the population standard deviation. The result is not always a whole number, though. The usual practice is to round up any fractional result to the next whole number. Again, you still got a person. You just <laughs> so you can't have a fraction of a person. You got to go up to a whole person. So that's why we typically round up and not round down. I know y'all just went, what? <laughs> We have a fraction of a person. No, it's not two and a half men here. Can't have a half of a man. You can still have a man. All right. <coughs> Sorry. I apologize for all the coughing. The sample size to estimate a population mean. Example. So why not knock out an example? So a student and public administration wants to estimate the mean monthly earnings of a city council member in large cities. She can tolerate a margin of error of $100 in estimating the mean. She would also prefer to report the interval estimate with a 95% level of confidence. Again, there's our classic 95%, and we know what Z value it is 1.96. How do I have that memorized? Uh, the student <laughs> found a report of the Department of Labor that reported a standard deviation of $1,000. What is the required sample size? Okay. So to compute, we're going to take the Z value of 1.96 multiplied by 1,000 and then divide by 100 squared. Which, of course, once we divide by 100, the margin of error, we come out to 19.6. Squared is 384.16. And again, we have something there. So once it goes into decimal form, we always round up to 385. 
So a sample size of 385 is required to meet the specifications that we decide to have in this uh, example. All right, so now let's look at sample sizes for proportions. Woo! I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. There are three factors that determine the sample size when we wish to estimate a proportion. And look, there's our fancy friend of <laughs> margin of error. It's back. And the desired level of confidence. Those don't change. But the variation or dispersion of population being studied. <gasps> wow. Looks like the same stuff is back. So the formula to determine the sample size of a proportion is going to be n equals x, the population proportion, multiplied by 1 minus x, of our population proportion, multiplied by the z value divided by the margin of error squared. Okay. Now, For an example, the students in the previous example also want to estimate the proportion of cities that have privately refused collectors. The students want to estimate the population proportion with a margin of error of 0 0.10, preferred to the level of confidence of 90%. Wow, they actually use a different percentage. And it has no estimate for the population proportion what is the required sample size? All right. So they really got a little bit more in depth with the Z value. Because let's see if we can go back to the Z value. So here's our Z value. And they came up with 1.645. So they really went a little bit deeper than what our table can do. So, more power to them. But again, we would take the 90%, divide by 2, and then we're going to find that number. Apparently, they got 1.645. That's fine. We're going to go through our examples, or our practice problems, and do it, and probably perform some of these as well. Now, Again, using the formula, we have 0 0.50, which again is our population proportion. We typically will use this when we don't really know uh, what the population proportion is. Okay, so again. When it becomes more of an unknown, the largest value using will be 0 0.50. So an estimate, that's why they're using 0 0.50 as the uh, population proportion. Um, so 1 minus 0 0.50, half, half. Um, then we multiply by 1.645, divide by 0 0.10, which again was the margin of error squared. Comes out to 67.65. Again, we can't have just 0.65 of a city. It rounds up to 68 cities. Okay. Fun. Now, y'all ready for some practice problems? You're like going, yeah, let's do this. Let's go on, brave adventurers. Or, yeah, I think we only got like three or four. Okay, so a research firm surveyed 49 random selected Americans to determine the mean amount spent on coffee during one week. The sample mean was $20 per week. The population distribution is normal and is with a standard deviation of $5. All right. So again, may, try and do these by yourself. And then determine the actual answer. 
um, by watching the video. See how well you've done. So question A is going to ask, what is the point estimate of the population mean? We don't know this. This is unknown. Again, we don't know the actual population mean, so we're going to use the sample mean of $20 per week. It's our best estimate. Okay. Now, even though we don't know the population mean and we have to use $20, we still know the population standard deviation. So that means we can still use a Z value. So going all the way back, since we're not doing with proportions, that means we're going to be using this formula. Again, the sample mean plus or minus Z value times the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Y'all just went, yay! Just flash, flash, flash. Alright, so let's get our calculator. Okay, so calculator. We're going to take first off. Five dollars divided by the square root. Uh, okay, five. Oh wait, should be five divided by. Okay. So I have to know how to punch it into this calculator sometimes, but it works. So 5 divided by 49 square root, which again is 7. And then we multiply it by our z value, 1.96. Comes out to 1.4. So we can take that. 20 minus 1.4. That is our lowest, which is 18.6. With that standard uh, with the 95% level of confidence and then also find our high term 20 plus 1.4 so it's either going to fall between 18.6 or 21.4 that is our confidence interval with 95% so that's where our population mean should fall okay so there's one Question two, seems a little bit more fun. So the owner of Britain's egg farm wants to estimate the mean number of eggs produced per chicken. A sample of 20 chickens showed that produced an average of 20 eggs per month, with a standard deviation of two eggs per month. Okay. Whew. Ready to hit all these? All right. So what does the value of the population mean? What is the best estimate of this value? Again, the population mean is unknown. So the best is using the sample size that we have, which is 20. Again, on average, which is just means mean of 20 eggs. Alright, but we also don't know the population standard deviation. This is unknown, so now it's the t value. Okay, and it looks like we're going to have to probably pop up the chart. Let's see. Yeah, because we're supposed to hit 19. So let me go pop up the chart. Okay, so here's our chart. And we're going to figure out our little uh, 95%. So here's our 95% confidence level. And remember, 
degrees of freedom is going to take our sample size, which is 20. Oh, it's not even showing on here, guys. There you go. Sorry about that. So, oh, things just going a little fun. So, here we go. Here's the chart. Again, you got to go to your book, B.5, T distribution, and we're going to look at the 95% confidence level. And then since our sample size was 20 chickens, remember, degrees of freedom takes the sample size and minus 1. So it's going to be looking over here. So 95% confidence level at the 19 degrees of freedom, 20 minus 1, comes out to 2.093. Okay, Again, because we don't have um, the knowledge of what the standard deviation is uh, for the population, that's why we're using the t-value. So again, 2.093. Once we have this, we can determine basically the margin of error which again is that formula t minus, uh, t multiplied by the um, the sample mean oh <laughs> By the sample standard deviation and divide by the square root of the number. I don't know why all of a sudden it's like, can't get it out. <laughs> so, we know it's 2.093, so let's bring up our calculator. So, to find the margin of error, take our t value. And you can actually do this in parentheses. Our standard deviation, our sample standard deviation, divide by our sample size, square root. And we find out that it's like 0.936, so forth and so on, round to the two nearest uh, decimal places, which will end up being 0.94. Most of the time, it's going to be two decimal places. It makes life easy. Again, we can do plus minus this old big number, but make sure your homework, see what it says. All right. So, again, since this is our margin of error, 0.94 rounded, we can add 20 to it to find our high range, and then 20 minus 0.94 will be our low range. So our range is 19.06 to 20.94. So F will ask you, would it be reasonable to conclude that the population mean is 21 eggs? The answer will be no, because it's not in this uh, interval. It's almost, almost, with the 20.94, but it is just slightly higher than that. And then, of course, 25 eggs is higher than that, so that, again, will not be reasonable. So it has to fall between 19.06 and 20.94. So really, looks like it's going to be closer to 20. 20 eggs, uh, actually an egg. But, I mean, that's how it is. That's our reasonable population mean. All right. Calculate back down. Question 19. A population standard deviation is 10. We want to estimate the population mean with a margin of error of 2 with a 95% level of confidence. How large is the sample that is required? 
All right. So again, we're looking at sample sizes right here. So we should be looking at our sample size of estimating the population mean with the z-value and the population standard deviation divided by e. Whoop. Ah, that went too far. All right. So, formula. Calculator. Cal, 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 calculator. Solving problems. Ow. Okay. So, 95%, we're using the z value. We know that's 1.96. Multiply it by our standard deviation, which is 10. We want to divide it by the margin of error, which is 2. And then that number gets a good old square root. Okay, not square root, uh, square root. Been doing too many square roots already today, but the square of 9.8 is 96.04. Since again, we cannot have a decimal when we're looking at sample sizes, it will move up, even though it's 0 0.04, it will move up to 97. So our answer will be 97. Okay, last but not least, question 25. So it says, suppose the U.S. presidents want to estimate the proportion of the population that supports his current policy towards revisions in the health care system. The president wants a margin of error of 0 0.04, assume a 95% level of confidence. The president politician, oh, political advisor sorry, uh, found a similar survey from two years ago. That reported that 60% of the people supported the health care revisions. Okay. So, since we found an actual report that has 60% uh, of the people, I mean, that's our population proportion, we're going to use that to first determine how long, because there's already an estimate. Now, again, we're going to be using now this formula, the proportion. So in order to use it, let's find our calculator. Okay. We're going to take 0.6, which was the estimate. Do this. Let's clear out. So 0 0.6 multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.6. Okay. That's going to be 0 0.24. Now let's go ahead and do that square root. I mean, not square, square. I don't want to say square root so much. But which that part of the formula is 1.96 divided by 0 0.04, our margin of error. Then we square, then multiply by 0.24. We come out to 576.24, but again, remember, we have to round up. So, 57, uh, 577. Okay, and that will be our sample size based on the estimate that we've already found. Now, question B goes, what if we don't have an estimate uh, was available? Well, if there's not an estimate, we fall to the default of 0.5. Now, I'm going to do the square first this time because I think that will be a little bit easier to see. So, again, 1.96 divided by our margin of error that we want squared, good. Then multiply that by 0.5, multiply, 
again by 1 minus 0.5 because I want to show all the formula parts and then let's enter we come out to 600.25 which again we have to round up to 601 okay and that's it that's chapter 9 woo now ah, I mean a lot of math base a lot of knowledge base a lot of figure out do we have this is it known or unknown once you get that down, this chapter becomes a lot easier to figure out the formulas. Make sure you have a piece of paper always with you with all these formulas. Okay? And that will conclude this chapter. Again, if you have any questions, brave adventurers, please let me know. Uh, send me that good old email, and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. By then, that's it. Y'all have a great, wonderful time, and I will see you in the next exciting quest or chapter in business statistics.